I like how Kenny zoomed in. I like how he started by talking about and appreciating all of you who came here, all of the user community in Europe that couldn't come here, and then focusing on the people of Instructure, the folks who work on Canvas and these other great products, and then finally by ending with his, his family because that's where the meaning is for him. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit today about some of the ideas and some of the research and some of the stories that give me meaning for the work that we do with Canvas and that we're going to continue to do. And zooming in to small changes that can have a big impact. So speaking of small change, if I were to offer you one pence that doubles every day for 30 days, or a million pounds sterling, which would you take? Raise your hand if you would take the million pounds. Oh, everybody knows this one, yeah. For those of us who were English majors, math is hard. Yeah, but you're right. You would take the one pence that doubles every day for 30 days. You would end up with more than, a mil uh, more than five million pounds, which is a much better deal. I like this idea that small investments over time pay off in a really big way. Earlier this year, as I started preparing for the Canvas cons that I do every year, I heard this story that really resonated with that idea. This is Cindy Allen. She is a grade seven science teacher at Spring Creek Middle School in the United States. And like many K through 12 teachers, she was extremely busy throughout the day dealing with the ins and outs, the face-to-face, -face, the adherence to standards, and assessing her students. And even though her school and her entire district had Canvas available, she felt like she didn't have time to go digital. But what she decided to do, because she felt like there was some value, maybe not clear what that value would be specifically, she took a little bit of time every single day to go digital. She would take some of the standards aligned content that she had been given from the district and digitize that and put that in Canvas modules in the form of pages, right? Pretty straightforward. But she did this a little bit every day and over the period of six months ended up with a hundred, hundreds, over 300 digital resources that were available to her students online. And as she went through this process of thinking paper to digital documents, she began to explore some of the other ways she could go digital, like taking paper assignments and turning them into self-graded quizzes in Canvas. So she made a small change, 15 minutes or so every single day, and if she didn't have time to get something done, she would put in a placeholder, come back to that later. But she saw some big impacts. Now the small change that she implemented, that adding a lesson daily and putting some paper assignments into online quizzes, paid off in a way that she didn't really expect. For K through 12 teachers especially, one of the continuous challenges is dealing with student absenteeism. Mm -hmm. Students are gone because they're sick, they're gone because they have family issues or maybe they go on vacation. How do they stay on top of things, especially if they don't ask for their work ahead of time? That was the key impact that she saw almost immediately is that going digital, having these materials and having these practice activities online helped neutralize absenteeism in her class. Additionally, by allowing students to work through activities on their own, whether in class or at home, through these digital assignments, she found that she had more time in her face-to-face -face sessions for the one-on-ones that she, she really knew that her students needed. So this was a good story that really started the ball rolling for me looking for and collecting stories of small changes that have a big impact. Now this is important in part because, right, we just don't have a lot of time. None of us do. And so even though it's our job as technologists to help make Canvas as easy to use as possible, to save you time, and to reward you, that's not all there is to it. Jim Stigler, who's a researcher who has studied different methods of teaching in different cultures around the world, observed that there's a lot more variation between different cultures than there is within a culture. Now that shouldn't be too surprising, but it reinforces the idea that teaching is a cultural activity. That each of us from our own cultures, and there are different cultures represented today, 
have our own mental script for how teaching and how learning is supposed to work. That script begins very, very early when we go to school and continues, especially for those of us who go on to tertiary education, to higher education. The model for teaching and learning is reified in our minds. So Jim said that because teaching is a system that is deeply embedded in the surrounding culture of schools, any changes will come in small steps, not dramatic leaps. And in fact, he warns us from looking for those big revolutionary changes, those top-down changes, if they don't have the support from the bottom up, if they're not realized in small ways at the ground level. This resonates with me through our work on Canvas because we also believe in small changes, in continuous improvement, and in making the technology offer progressive enhancements to you. And one example of that is the student mobile app, which we launched less than a year ago. Now, the mobile app updates on a different cycle than Canvas itself, and in less than a year, we've had 35 releases to the student mobile app. 35, that's like one a week in less than a year. And so that brings in capabilities for the students like a closer UI to match the web version. So we retain all of those inherent capabilities of native mobile apps, like the ability to use the iOS widgets to show students their grades or their scores. And it allows us to continue to develop the app as well at whatever pace we deem appropriate. And so right now we're working on one of the most used parts of Canvas by students, that's assignment submission. Making the assignment submission process through the native mobile app easier to understand and faster and more reliable. So continuous improvements, small changes over time that build up for a big impact, it's something we believe in. And so today, I'm gonna share with you some stories of small changes, and I'm going to tie those to how we think about the continued development and improvement of Canvas. And I'm gonna focus in that respect on some recent small changes to Canvas or some upcoming small changes to Canvas. Some of these recent changes, you may be aware of, you may not of. Some of them might be relevant to the way that you teach. Some of them might challenge you to think about new ways of implementing technology. And so through this process, I'm gonna focus on these three things that we believe that Canvas should be. Easy and rewarding, personally engaging and encouraging active learning, and open for innovation. So Cindy's story is a good example of using technology to manage your time, to increase your efficiency, and to open the doors to enhancing learning for your students. When we talk about making learning more personal or more active, it's good to start with some sense of what that actually means and what the research says on what kind of learning is best. Because we can make any number of small changes. They may not have a significant impact. So we want to be careful and we want to be deliberate in looking for what works in teaching and learning? Now, unfortunately, this doesn't really work. Uh, might be easier if it did, but one of the things that we know, and yet is still hard for a lot of educators to put into practice, is that simply transmitting information isn't as effective as getting students involved in the learning. A couple of years ago, we had physics professor Derek Muller at our InstructureCon. And he's done his PhD work on how students confront their misunderstandings about physics concepts. Now, in his research, he kind of revisited this classic challenge that has been shown, which is that in some cases, you can do a pre-test and a post-test with physics students. Pre-test them on the concept knowledge, teach them the concept, and then post-test them and you won't see any difference. Why is that? So I'm gonna play this very short video clip of Derek explaining what he saw from his TED Talk. The thing is, in science, students don't know nothing about what we're trying to teach them. They actually know lots of things through their interaction with the world. It just turns out that these things are wrong, scientifically speaking. <laughs> So when you present something, 
The student thinks they already know it, and they don't really pay utmost attention. They don't realize that what's being presented differs from their prior knowledge, and they just get more confident in those things that they were thinking beforehand. So actually, a clear expository summary is worse than no instruction at all. <laughs> we, we hope that's not true. A clear expository explanation is worse than no explanation at all. Um, but this is something that he saw, that students have sometimes fixed mental models of how something works, and teaching them how it actually works may not change that model, not unless you force them to kind of confront their misunderstanding. And so Derek did this a couple of different ways. One is he asked students to watch videos of other students struggling with or providing different answers to the same question. And two, and this is something that you can see in some of his videos up on YouTube, on his Veritasium channel, he breaks a video on a specific concept into two parts, into two parts. And the first part represents the problem, the concept from the point of view of what's going to happen, what can we expect to happen. And then the video ends, but as you can see here, the video ends with some options for students that basically ask the students or the learners or the watchers to answer the question, what's going to happen next? Now, he might show other people trying to answer the question, giving different answers, but it's the second video that actually provides the solution. And that second video might bait the hook for another continuance of this cycle, where there's another problem and another problem and another problem. And what this does, Derek found, is it forces students to confront those previously held understandings and possibly change them. Now this is something you can do in Canvas. One of my favorite ways to do that is simply by using a discussion forum where you put the first video in the, in the thread at the top and then you require students to post first before they see not only all the other students' answers but also the solution, perhaps in video form, that you have embedded there already. But I'm excited by some work that we've been doing over the last year on our video platform arc. So, Easier than breaking up a video and putting it in either two pages or in a discussion forum, ARC is going to let you embed questions directly into the video itself. So you can choose a video, you can choose any kind of question type, and at the point in the timeline when you want the question to appear, you simply author the question. You might make students uh, show their prediction or point out what their prediction is going to be for what's going to happen next. It might just be a comprehension check. But this is a cool thing. You can do any number of questions in a video. This is a cool thing because we're moving away from simply transmitting information to users to getting them actively involved in thinking about the information as it's presented to them and putting in the effort to recall as they go. So it is a pretty small change, whether you're splitting up the video into a problem, a solution, or you are nesting questions that ask students to get active during what is oftentimes a relatively passive learning experience. And I think part of why this works also relates to something in educational research called the testing effect. How many of you guys have heard of this, the testing effect? Yeah, not a lot of hands, maybe you're just shy, maybe you don't remember. Uh, the testing effect is something that's been replicated in educational research Mm, probably over a hundred times. And basically what it says is if you get two groups of students who are preparing for an exam, and you ask one group of students to reread the chapter or review their notes, and the other group of students to take a test or a quiz on the materials, guess which group is going to do better on the exam? Well, it's the students who are more active, who put in more effort. So this is one example of how that research plays out, where Two groups of students either studied more or took a practice test. And immediately after the first test, the students who studied more show a little bit of an advantage. But over time, and this is really, I think, what most of us care about in learning, that durable learning that lasts over time, the students who are more active, who took practice tests, do better. They actually retain more of that information because it makes the learning effortful. So it's this kind of research that, for people like me, can really inspire small changes. And so this next story 
was also inspired by research that Dr. Catherine Hubbard of University of Hull uh, encountered in a presentation on combining formative and summative assessments into a two-stage process. So this is her tweet from May 2016. I heard about Dr. Hubbard's story through Joel Mills earlier this summer at InstructureCon. Joel, are you here? Raise your hand. Okay, so you can bug him uh, if you want more details or you want to see how good I got this story, how close it was to reality. So she saw this presentation on formative and summative design. And it inspired her to tackle this really broad challenge. How can we improve learning and engagement amongst our students, especially in large courses? That's what the original research study was about. Now, Dr. Hubbard was using formative assessments already. So you can kind of see here, I've mocked up, there might be a pretest or a formative test that doesn't count toward your final grade. It's the summative test that comes later. And with that formative test, students might have the opportunity to review their scores and answers and take the, the test or quiz again, but that's optional. Now in the two-stage format, here's the change. Okay, I'm gonna hop back there. The change is to provide some additional structure and some additional rules to help guide students through one workflow or another. So the formative test or quiz now has a requirement, which you can set in Canvas, that students must have 80% or higher in order to proceed to the summative test. This is a basic mastery model. Now, if they don't score 80% or higher, they are given feedback, but it's not the scores and the answers necessarily. If they get a question wrong, they are given hints to encourage them to go back into the material to put in that effort to find the information or the knowledge themselves. If they do, have the 80% or higher, they move on, they can take the summative test, and that provides feedback with scores only, but a week later, that's when the answers are presented. And there's a lot of reasons why you might wanna wait a week to give the answers. It might be to pace that information, it might be to encourage students to look into the materials on their own, it could be a number of different reasons. But this was a relatively small change from where Dr. Hubbard was, to have a significant impact on students. Now, going back to uh, Dr. Vogel's original research, here's one of the uh, quotes from students in the research experiment, which really stood out to me. So if you do have the assessment, yeah, it sounds like a lot more work, but at least it's making you do the work. At least it's making you do the work. And that's something that we also see when we simply present information to students. There's not a lot of accountability that they actually do it, and this is a perpetual struggle for a lot of educators and a lot of lecturers. So the small change in Dr. Hubbard's case, moving from simply formative assessment to a two-stage mastery assessment, and once you set it up, it's pretty much good to go semester after semester. So there is more upfront work, but the reward is pretty significant. Improved performance, and increased engagement, much like we saw in that last quote. Now again, you wanna to talk to Joel about this project because it's still proceeding and they're going to have results of their three-year study of applying this research with Canvas uh, in the next year or so. So look forward to them talking about it at a Canvas Con or an Instructure Con. Um, and this idea of you know, setting up things that are automated in Canvas to help guide students through the experience. It's one that we think a lot about as we develop the product as well. And some of you may have heard of this experiment that we're running right now in a part of the community that we call Canvas X. This particular experiment is called Nudge. And the idea behind Nudge is that Canvas knows a lot about your learners. It knows a lot about you as teachers as well. So what if we nudged learners to engage in the right kind of behavior at the right time? So in the early stages of this experiment, we focused on prompting students to engage in the course and specifically to resubmit assignments or quizzes when they had the opportunity to. Not always, but when they had the opportunity to. And in the first round of the nudge research, or actually this, the second round of the Nudge research, sorry, just wrapped up. Uh, we applied Nudge to over 10 courses and 163 students. 
And we saw a 78% view rate for the nudges that went out, and they went out through normal Canvas channels, including through messages, including through notifications. But we saw over these 10 courses a 10% increase in the, uh, in the amount of student submissions that were put in on time. So a 10% decrease in late work, 10% increase in on-time submissions. And so this is really encouraging to us. The current work on Nudge is to go a step further, to really personalize the nudges. So we're talking about late assignments, late submissions. There are some students who, maybe like me, maybe not, are prone to turn things in late, habitually. Maybe we wait till the last minute to turn stuff in. Canvas should have enough data on us as individuals to know that and thereby personalize the nudges so that if you are the student who tends to turn things in late, you'll be nudged ahead of time that there's a due date coming up and you might want to get on that work. You might want to turn that in on time. By the same token, if you're the kind of student who always turns everything on time, Canvas should be smart enough not to nudge you, not to bother you with that. And further down the pipe, right? So if you continuously ignore the nudges, we need to stop bugging you with them. That's the idea here, is that we're applying machine learning to the data behind the scenes to personalize nudges. And now this is a really great example of a small change. In fact, it's a, a zero change. You don't have to set anything up. You simply have to use Canvas as normal and the smarts behind the scenes will make it work. So if you're interested in Nudge, you can sign up to try it in the, uh, the next available pilot. Go to the Canvas community, type community.canvaslms.com slash community slash ideas. You'll, feel, you'll see a section on Canvas X where you can learn about Nudge, you can find out when the next pilot is, you can find out about a couple of the other data science related projects that the Canvas X team is working on. So just to be super clear, these are all experimental. These are all prototypes. These may or may not actually make it into the Canvas products. But it's important that we have this space to try new things out that are really focused on increasing student learning and engagement, leveraging data science. Now this next story of small change comes from Middlesbrough College from the Construction Trades Program. And James Well, the head of digital curriculum, shared this story with me. Construction trades, you think it's a lot of hands-on, it's a lot of face-to-face, -face, and that's true. But there is a lot of submitted work as well, a lot of written work as well. And in these face-to-face -face interactions, it's pretty easy to give students feedback that they will then immediately apply, and you can see them apply it. One of the things that Middlesbrough explained to me, which was concerning, is that they weren't seeing instructors in this program providing feedback that actually helped students improve on their submitted work. Okay. And this is pretty typical. You ask students to submit a project, a paper, an assignment, even if it's online. It doesn't mean you have to do anything with it. And for a lot of students, if they don't get direct feedback on that work, they might wonder, well, did they even see it? So at Middlesbrough, what they saw were that uh, instructors and tutors in the construction trades program were giving confirmatory feedback. Either you passed or you didn't, and there you go, you can move on. When they adopted Canvas, of course, that brings you SpeedGrader and the time savings there. And the thing that you may have noticed about SpeedGrader is that Canvas assignments allow for resubmissions by default. Like, that's what it does, and that's on purpose, right? Not just because students often make a mistake and you don't want to email your professor and say, oh, don't look at that first submission, look at the second submission, right? Or delete that first submission. Um, but also because we want to encourage this feedback loop. We want to encourage tutors and lecturers to look deeply at student work, give feedback, and enable learners to take that feedback, apply it, and resubmit it. That doesn't happen automatically. It does require that the tutors and the lecturers get on board. So here's a screenshot that, that was sent to me. This is from Gary Mickle's course. And, and you can just see, this is speed grader. I'm kind of calling out the level of feedback that's being done through the new Canvas Doc Viewer tool that's now in speed grader. Um, and the back and forth that's happening, and we, we hid the student comments, the back and forth that's happening between Gary and his student. So it's working. It did require a shift in mindset, 
but it is having a pretty dramatic impact. So they shifted the tutor's mindset to not only allow for, but encourage resubmission through the online marking. And they've seen some pretty dramatic impacts already. They've seen the Department for Education move them from the second quartile to the first quartile for the national rates for, 18 to, uh, for 16 to 18 year old retention and pass rates. And from the third quartile to the first quartile for the level three progress applied general score, all in less than a year after moving for, to Canvas. All right, there are some features that we've released this year that are really focused on assessments and improving that process and that workflow. And I'm not just talking about quizzes next or new quizzes, which is now in general availability, but for example, the automagic late policies. So if you want to allow student resubmissions and resubmissions even after the due dates, and you're using scores or you're using points or you're using any kind of marked value on the assignments, automagic late policies allows you to apply a deduction for late submissions automatically. So you can still allow for the late submissions, that's awesome, but there might be a penalty to incentivize students to get them in on time. If you don't use that kind of points-based or scored assessment, the new non-scoring rubrics is pretty exciting as well. We decided not to call this pointless rubrics. <laughs> we think about this sometimes. Um, but yeah, basically, you use a rubric, you can use it with outcomes or rubric uh, line items, and you simply say remove the points from this rubric. So it's a way of encouraging students to think about the feedback and to help you as a lecturer or a tutor to move quickly through providing students with specific feedback without focusing them on the point values, which is very important. Uh, one other feature that we announced at, well, it's not really a feature. It's like actually a whole new thing. We announced this at InstructureCon in July, is that we have a really special partnership now with Badger. So Badger provides open badges around the world. I would say they are the premier badging provider. And we created an arrangement with them to make sure that Badger was available to all of the international regions that we serve. And that was no small undertaking. But the idea here is now that badging or micro-credentialing is available really easily to anybody. All you have to do is ask your CSM to turn it on, and it can be turned on at the course level or at the sub-account level. And basically what it does is it provides you with the opportunity to create a badge or a micro-credential in your module, in your course, in your program, and tie that to requirements within the Canvas course or module. And there's a lot of cool features associated with this, right? So when a student completes a badge, it's an open badge, it lives on the open web, they can put that into their LinkedIn profile as additional evidence that they've actually learned something aside from having the paper diploma or degree. At the very least, I think it will add color to individuals' profiles as they develop these on the open web and they begin looking for careers and jobs. But you can also do a lot of other fun things with Badger. There's leaderboards so that you can gamify your course. Um, and we can talk to you about additional capabilities in Badger Pathway that Badger is making available uh, for a premium. But Badger itself, in Canvas, free, ready to go. Just ask your CSM to turn it on and, and start experimenting with it. I think there's gonna be a lot of little stories coming out of this, a lot of stories of small changes in badging from people who had never really thought about trying it before. Okay, um, before the last story, let me ask you a pop quiz. Let me give you a pop quiz, ask you a question. Now, I'll, I'll apologize. Most of the research I look at is from the US. That's where I am. So this may not apply in the UK or Europe in the same way, but let's try it. When asked, what do students say is the most important thing that teachers can do for them? Is it that, and I'll just ask you to raise your hands. Is it that they are responsive to my needs? Raise your hand if you think that's the right answer. Responsive to my needs. Yeah, nobody likes that one or that they provide timely feedback. Okay, got some responses there. That they interact with me frequently, about the same. That they care about me as a person, oh yeah. Well, it's a trick question. They're, these are all 
the most important thing to students depending on the study that you look at. They're all very, very close in one study. And in the second study, teachers care about me as a person rises to the top. And that kind of makes sense because cares about me as a person kind of encompasses those previous three things. And this is important, I think, for us at Canvas as we look at ways in which technology can automate things, can personalize things, because the human element to teaching and learning remains critically important. So I'm going I'm to share a really quick example from my own past. This is a picture from 2010. Uh, I dug this, this up when we were in Sydney a few weeks ago. Uh, teaching in a live face-to-face -face classroom, I taught digital media. And again, as we saw in the Middlesbrough example, when you're face to face with students, it's pretty easy to look at their work, give them some feedback, and watch them apply it right then in the moment. When I taught online, I found that that wasn't necessarily the case. That even though I was using SpeedGrader, using a rubric, giving text feedback on student projects, they weren't necessarily applying it at the rate that I wanted them to. And when I asked some students about this, one of them was like, well, you're kind of mean. Have you ever had that happen to you? You send an email and the language is not interpreted the way that you expected it to. Yeah, it happens to us all the time. So a colleague of mine suggested this small change. Uh, she said, hey, you know, Canvas lets you record those videos in SpeedGrader. Why don't you just record a video along with the rest of your feedback to tell students good job or maybe summarize the feedback? And I'm like, yeah, that seems like a lot of time. He was like, no. She said, just, uh, Limit yourself, you know? Don't spend more than 30 seconds or a minute on each video, and do it at the end of your feedback process so that it comes really naturally. And just tell them, good job, and encourage them. and Focus on the things that you liked. So I did that. I limited myself to 60-second videos on every single project, and I did see, actually, an increase in the number of resubmissions, the application of the feedback that I was getting. And I think my, teacher, my students liked me a little better, too. So. Um, so for me, that was really powerful. Good example of a, a small change in my own teaching that could have a big impact um, with technology that maybe I wasn't even aware of, capabilities that I hadn't really thought of using before, even though I thought I understood Canvas really well. So that takes us to this last story. It's a little bit of a different story than the other stories I've shared so far. Um, it involves a number of small changes in both the students and the teachers who are struggling to engage in a radically different learning environment than you and I might be familiar with. Now, this comes from the US, but I'm finding that the core challenges faced here apply in a lot of different places in which we, we serve you, Canvas. It's not unique to the US. So I'm going to play this video, and we'll see how it goes. In prison, it's particularly difficult for these guys because on top of not having a high school credential, they also, of course, have a criminal background, sometimes several felonies, a long rap sheet of criminality. So when they hit the gate or when they're released from the facility, they really have very few resources at their disposal. At first, being a felon, I was like, man, I'm done. There's nothing I can do anymore in my life. is. You know, I'm gonna be stuck, dead in jobs, just trying to survive paycheck to paycheck. Large Correction Center has a resident population of about 480 people. It's a minimum security facility with most folks uh, looking at reentry within about one to four years. So the guys who are here are on track to return to the community. And so our charge is to not only just empower them with education, but to give them a lot of the skills and a lot of the educational tools that they need. One of the things that's really important to understand about inmates is they're bored. For the most part, they're stuck here and they, they're hungry for good opportunities, they're hungry for worthwhile things. And so the more you can give them to help them grow and help them keep them busy, the better off. Well, being incarcerated, I think it's important to separate yourself from actual prison and try to get involved in things to better yourself and to not be in prison, I guess. And so education is one of those methods. Big thing you gotta understand about prisons is 
the logistical limitations that the inmates are under. We have no internet, so they never have access. Um, as a teacher, I don't even have it in the classroom. So we're currently working on, on laptops that will sync up to Canvas, secure laptops with, with prison specs, clear bottoms, no cameras, things like that. A student will be able to bring that in, plug into a special uh, secured box, and sync up to Canvas, which will download the materials that they need. And then they can take that back to the unit, work in the evenings and the weekends. Particularly in math instruction, Canvas is instrumental because it truly allows students to work on any math subject. It's not just about working at your own pace. It's about targeting the area that you know you have to improve and having the tools at your disposal in Canvas. The major thing that's changed is my ability to use technology because when I fell in 2005, this, it was, everything was pencil to paper. I like tools and, and the ability to use tools is, is one of my strengths and, and I can see this as Canvas as a tool that, that helped me. More than I really have my head wrapped around at this point is possible because of the technology, not in spite of the technology or in spite of the environment. A lot of them never really felt that college was something that they were ever going to be any good at. And now, having actually gone through some of their very first college classes, they realize, wow, this is actually not as bad as I thought it was going to be. This is something I can really, really do. And this is what's going to keep me out of trouble going forward. I mean, I want to be able to get out and have some proof that I was better than myself, that I didn't waste the time that I, that I spent incarcerated. So not just for me, but for my family to show that I'm, I'm changed, that I put in the work, the effort to get out a different, better man. Well, I don't look at it as I'm done. I look at it as part of a, a journey. And so I'm never gonna stop learning. My first job in distance ed was converting paper-based independent study courses to web-based courses. This, this was, well, I won't say the year, but it was in the late 90s. Um, and I remember at the time thinking, you know, this is the way of the future. But my, my supervisor at the time said, yeah, well, we're going to keep having these paper-based independent study courses, too. And I said, well, why, why is that? And one of the reasons he cited was that because the paper-based independent study courses go out to the prisons, go out through the correction system so that inmates can have access to higher education or you know, even education to finish their, um, you know, to finish their K through 12 degrees or diplomas. <clears throat> uh, so that was really powerful to me. But of course, nowadays, paper is becoming increasingly a part of the, the past. And even the program that I cut my teeth on is no longer offering paper-based independent study. They just killed that program entirely for these, these prison inmates. So it's reliant upon a lot of these educators to come onto the prison grounds in order to deliver education. So technology becomes really important in facilitating that. And so we'll talk, talk about that a little bit more. Now, in preparation for visiting large corrections, I did a fair amount of research on recidivism in the United States and found that, of course, you know, recidivism is really high, but the odds of, an in, uh, of a former prisoner recidivating after release is extremely diminished if they've gone through an educational program. And in a cursory glance of research on Australia and here in the United Kingdom, we find things are similar as well, that participating in prison education can lower recidivism rates by as much as a third. So it's pretty powerful stuff. Now, in this video, what was the small change? Well, it wasn't the change to start using technology. In fact, that was a bit of a heavy lift on the technology front. And it wasn't the change from a traditional face-to-face -face classroom to doing hybrid learning so that students could do some of the work on their secure laptops in their cells, in their free time, without focusing all of that in the limited face-to-face -face time that they have with the faculty member. The small change that I want to talk about here was really in Canvas. And it was a change that we committed to just about nine, 10 years ago. 
and that was that the Canvas source code is open. Now, I bet a lot of you knew that, that Canvas's source code is open. And I bet a lot of you never really cared about that either. But through the years, we have released the Canvas source code on GitHub on the exact same three-week cycle that we release changes to you all on the cloud. And we've seen some small benefits of being open source, but open source is a value to us. And open source is a way that we knew early on, we believed early on, would have benefits to us and to the educational community well into the future. That it would open up ways of innovating that perhaps we couldn't even perceive today. And see, that's the problem with the future. We don't know what it holds for us. And what we found continuously is that openness, whether it's adherence to open technology standards, encouragement of open educational resources, or simply making the source code itself open, allows institutions and individuals to adapt to an uncertain future. And that's what we saw here. So Ray Pulsifer, one person, by the way, working with Large Corrections, took the Canvas open source code, installed it locally within the prison system, and then went a couple steps farther. Now, this is in the state of Washington in the United States, and all of the community and technical colleges are using Canvas. What that means is that it's relatively easy for a tutor or a lecturer at one of the colleges to take their Canvas course and bring it into the prison, because it's all standard common cartridge format. Right? And they're also engaged in open educational resources. So a lot of the material that they have is, of course, free to reuse, but they can pick and choose from the materials that their colleagues around the state have produced and shared as well. The other part here that's really important is that not only did Ray install Canvas locally, it's not that hard to do, he's begun working with the Canvas Open APIs to build an offline capability for the prisoner laptops. And so that's pretty exciting for us. We've heard institutions ask for offline before. It's not been high enough priority by enough of you that it's come onto our roadmap, and it's still not yet. But that's one of the values of openness, is even if we can't do everything, we can enable you to do anything. So there's GitHub, or Canvas is open source. And it's not just Canvas itself, which we call Canvas community version. Uh, it's a lot of the components of Canvas as well, the additional capabilities, like the mobile apps, they're open source. Like our accessibility checker, which we wrote for the tiny MCE text editor that we use in Canvas, but that too is open source. Like the Canvas skill that we released last year for Alexa. This is a really good example because a skill for Alexa, it's not something that everybody's going to use. It's something that a student could use without their teacher doing anything different, much like Nudge, but it's kind of leading edge technology and it's a while before voice services and personal assistants have reached full saturation, have really diffused. But we thought it was important enough that we built the skill and we open sourced it so that those in the community who care about it deeply can take it, improve upon it, contribute back, reshare. So the last product uh, enhancement that I want to show you guys coming very soon deals with commons. And I mentioned that the state of Washington, community technical colleges, use open educational resources a lot. In fact, they've saved their students over $8 million US dollars in textbook costs over the last four years by creating free open textbooks. And a lot of those materials or books are shared on Commons, which is, if you don't know, our learning object repository. I like to think of it more as a library of teaching practices because it's not just about sharing and reusing files, it's about sharing and reusing files or documents, or discussions, or assignments, or modules, or quizzes, or courses? What would you guess is the most shared learning activity type on Canvas Commons? Anybody guess? Most shared activity type. I hear some whispers. Something needs to be louder. Quiz. quiz. I heard two people say quiz. Man, every time I've asked this over the last three months, Somebody's gotten it right. It's quizzes, which is kind of cool because, I mean, quizzes are, are hard to make. It's really hard to make a good quiz. 
Um, and they're the kinds of things that you can plug in and create these formative assessments, these practice activities that tap into more active learning. So the thing that we're working on right now for Commons, uh, amongst a number of improvements, is Commons Previewer. Now, this is the most frequently requested enhancement for Commons. You can go in Commons, you can browse through all of the learning activities, and in order to try it out today, you need to bring it into your Canvas course or module, and then you can decide if it's right for you. But Commons Preview is actually pretty awesome. It doesn't just give you a preview, it actually lets you step through all of the components of a learning activity, whether it's an entire course, as you see here, with multiple modules and multiple activity types, or a single activity, and really look deeply, see it in its natural form, and even interact with it. So we think this is going to lower the barrier and re reduce some of the frustration amongst finding, discovering, and reusing open educational resources in Commons, and we're really excited for what the future holds here, because to date, over five million students have been impacted by openly licensed materials on Canvas Commons. And we want to see that number continue to rise and rise. <clears throat> this is the last example I wanted to share with you because it's an example of sharing itself. Right? And one of the things that I've learned as I've, uh, as I've dived into these examples of small changes with big impact is that changing itself thrives on sharing. That new ideas diffuse most readily when we share them through our social or professional networks. Like that's a fundamental idea behind the diffusion of innovation. So change thrives on sharing. And some of these examples I heard about word of mouth, some of these examples I actually saw on the Canvas community or through an InstructureCon or through a CanvasCon. But there are a lot more stories of small changes out there. So the other thing that I've learned is that the sooner you start, the better. The sooner you start with a small change, and that's why they need to be small, the more likely you are to change your practice and to slightly shift your own culture of education in a positive direction. And the sooner you start sharing, the better, the broader, the deeper the impact can be. So I know you're going to learn a lot from CanvasCon today. I hope you'll look at each session with an eye for what are the smallest changes that I or my teaching staff or my faculty can adopt to improve teaching and learning. Uh, but let me leave you with this last challenge. Before you leave, let's just start now. I want you to take just a minute or two, introduce yourself to a neighbor, somebody you don't know. Describe one small change that you have seen at your institution, small change that a teacher has made a lecturer has made, a tutor has made, that's had a big impact. And if you have great ideas, either from this conversation that's about to happen or the conversation that happens through the day, please do share them on social media. Hashtag them CanvasCon. It makes us e it easier for this community to find them, learn, and continue to grow well into the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>